Okay, folks, we're going to start right on time uh, today. So we're getting into the day on a very g uh, scheduled note and everything. So as people come in, um, I would like to welcome you to the next uh, session in the business and strategy track for DrupalCon. Um, the Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, the slides uh, for the sessions... Uh, Look, I'm not sure exactly when they're going to appear. Um, will be released all for all sessions at the same time. So check the session page. You'll be able to download those. Also, there'll be an audi uh, the audio for the session um, with uh, live slides in the in the in the in a YouTube video available for download from the site as well. Um, I'd also ask you to uh, please fill in the, your session evaluation. Uh, you go to the se the schedule page on the website and you'll be able to evaluate the sessions that you go to. And that goes into uh, feedback back to the presenters and back to the DA. So we'd really appreciate your, um, a, a, sh a short amount of time to do that. You can also post comments on the session pages. Um, I am going to pre-excuse myself because I've got to go check out of my room in a minute, <laughs> but I'll be back. Um, but in the meantime, before I do, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Pam. Um, Pamela Barone uh, is um, going to be taking this, s s this uh, session. Uh, she is uh, a web project manager at Previous Next here in Sydney. Uh, she manages large-scale web development projects on the Drupal platform, of course. Uh, so she has uh, the ac absolutely the right prerequisites to be talking about requirements for your Drupal projects. Um, she currently specialises in delivering Drupal to government, higher education and media organisations, which I think are uh, previous next key verticals, uh, using Agile methodology. Um, her session is entitled Rethink Your Requirements. Please welcome Pamela Barone. Can everybody hear me? All right. So um, as Mark said, I'm here to talk about Drupal requirements. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think it's important to um, use Drupal to refine your requirements and then just give you a couple of ways that I've learned how to do that. Um, I just really believe that framing requirements in Drupal terms is the best way to get a good outcome on both sides of things. Um, it's a, the best way to leverage what Drupal does well to avoid misunderstandings down the road. Just a little bit about me. Mark introduced me already, but um, I'm a project manager for Previous Next in Sydney and I do mostly work on um, government media and higher education. This is just some of our recent work. Um, and before I started working in Drupal, I was a content editor at a large media company in the US. So my um, sort of formative years were on the other side, at the client side of things. And now I'm, now I'm on the, the dark side, the vendor side. Um, just first a disclaimer. There's no magic formula for how to do it in Drupal. Um, it's not a translation. It's not a, you know, this is the way you write them in Drupal. It's really just about. Um, getting started in the right direction, using, using Drupal terms, using Drupal um, methodology. Like, it, Drupal is already your framework, so it just makes sense to use what Drupal does when you're writing your requirements. Um, kind of some background on how this came about. This, this is what kept happening. The client would give us requirements. They would say what they wanted. We would deliver what we thought they wanted, and then they'd say, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, this happens all the time, and it's not unique to Drupal, but I think the great thing about Drupal is that there are a lot of ways you can use it to avoid this. And the kind of classic example that we see is, um, this is just a quick example, but the client says we need to integrate video with Brightcove, that's our video provider, so we just need to get Brightcove video on our Drupal site. We say, no problem, there's a module for that. This will be an hour, easy, great. Then you deliver and they say, right, this, this is fine, but we need to um, put our player IDs in to target our pre-roll ads. <laughs> and you say, ah, okay, well the, the module doesn't actually do that. Um, we can do it, but it's actually going to take 10 hours instead of one hour. So 10 times as long as we said. Um, and there was no module. Like I said, incidentally, there is now a module for that <laughs> that we built because of this specific use case. But um, it just seems to happen over and over. And I, I realized that we've, we must be doing something wrong, right? The client told us what they thought we needed to know. They're not purposely holding back details because they're trying to mess us up. At least I don't think so. Anyway, they assumed, they assumed that when they said we need Brightcove, that it would include all of the stuff that they have in Brightcove, whereas that's not really how it works. But I mean, they told us what they thought we needed to know, and we thought they told us everything, <laughs> but they didn't. So I just started thinking, I mean, 
why does this keep happening and what are some ways that we can really avoid this in the future? And the, the real problem is that it's really hard to build a website from a stack of paper or um, just a collection of documentation because there are so many nuances and there are so many subtleties and there are so many different ways to do things that it's just really hard to say, here's what I want and then here's, here's that exactly as you envisioned it. So starting from the beginning, I just started to think about what are we, what are we really trying to accomplish with requirements? Um, and I think it's really whatever you need to understand what the client expects from the outcome. And successful delivery really depends on understanding exactly what they expect and why it's valuable to them. So I don't, I'm not really concerned about the format that you use for requirements. Is it user stories? Is it a 200-page you know, technical spec? Is it um, personas? You know, it doesn't really matter. And I don't, I don't really think the methodology that you use matters either. We happen to use Agile, but I don't think, that, um, I don't think that's too important to the underlying concept of just a, a mutual understanding of what they want and how you're going to deliver it. So where does Drupal come into this whole picture? Um, I think it should come in as soon as possible because you've already chosen Drupal as your framework, so why sort of pretend that that's not going to be what you're using? Um, discussing requirements in Drupal terms just reduces the potential for confusion and, and misunderstanding. And it eliminates some technical pitfalls that you can run into down the road if you implement something in a way that you thought made sense, but um, the client said, no, that's actually absolutely not going to work. And I think there's a little bit of hesitation among Drupal people to say, well, Drupal's so flexible, so I don't really think that we need to have Drupal requirements because you know, we don't want to make it seem like Drupal only does things a certain way. But if you're going to use Drupal, there's just no reason to kind of hesitate or, or try to avoid this because there are, there are two parts to it. Drupal is so flexible, and that's part of the problem. You can do anything, but should you is really the, is really the question. And the other thing is Drupal, Drupal provides a lot of things out of the box and does things really well, but also does things in a really specific way. So if you tell the client, yep, just tell me whatever you want in your words and I'll build it, you probably can, but you might end up undermining a lot of what you get with Drupal when it's delivered. So it's really not about saying, no, 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 we can't do that in Drupal. That's just not how it works. It's more about just um, being clear and, and being realistic about what you're going to give them. So this is a really standard requirement that we get on almost every project that we do now. Publishers must be able to quickly and easily revert changes to all pages. Um, it's pretty standard, but at the same time, this is not something that Drupal really does, to be completely honest. Drupal is not a page-centric model. Um, and that's not a weakness, it's just the way things work. It's very dynamic in nature, so that kind of snapshot of a whole page is just not something that really happens in Drupal. There are initiatives in progress now with content staging to enable this, but it doesn't exist at the moment. Um, and you can come really close, but it's not very easy. So when we see this, we say, yeah, we can do that, but if you meant publishers must be able to quickly and easily revert changes to all content, that's really how it works in Drupal. And it can seem like a small difference to Drupal people because we're just so used to that being the way it works and it works really well. But to content people, it's a major thing because if they come from a page-centric CMS, this might be a little bit scary to them. They say, well, what do you mean I can't have a snapshot of the whole page? I don't understand. Um, it, it seems like a weakness in the system, but it's really not. And, and in most cases, the content will suffice. Like Versioning the content is fine. It's plenty. It'll satisfy people, but you just have to be clear. So th this is the idea, basically, is that both of you are thinking about it in the same terms. We come to it with so much Drupal experience that it can seem, like I said, it can seem really um, unimportant that it versions content versus ver versioning pages because we're so used to it and we have a really clear picture of how it works. But in most cases, the client has never seen Drupal before. They don't understand how it works. They're coming from a CMS that might be really outdated and just does things in a completely different way. So they have just a different idea of how it works. So what you really need to do is specify how you're going to satisfy the requirement. Not, not just say, yep, we can do that. Tell them how. And then, like I said before, Drupal is really flexible. But at some point, it can become a liability. Because um, like I said, you can end up undermining, undermining the things that Drupal does really well. So trying to cobble together page versioning, just because that's what the RFP said, is a perfect example of um, you know, jumping through hoops and going in circles to make something happen that you really just don't need to do. So just be honest at the start. Um, revisioning content is really easy. Drupal does it. Drupal core does this. Revisioning pages is not easy. It's really hard. Um, and 
best case scenario, the client says, oh yeah, that's fine. It uh, doesn't really matter to me, that'll, that'll do. And if they say no, say why? What, what's your use case? Um, is it because you're afraid people are gonna publish things that they shouldn't have and you wanna be able to undo it? Well, let's try a workflow system, a really strict workflow system. Is it because you wanna keep an archive of what your site looked like on a given day? Well, we've actually built a, an HTML crawler for that. It's a, lot, um, it's a lot more lightweight and it's stored on a separate server so you can click through and see what the entire site looks like at any given time. And that's completely outside of Drupal and it, in some cases that will meet the needs. And then it could just be, well no, our editors have to switch between versions of pages a lot um, and that's why we want it. And you can say, well, versioning the content will probably be enough because the dynamic list is probably completely independent of that. So. Um, Building page revisions is, is a really major commitment and it requires a lot of planning and it affects a lot of the rest of your site architecture. So it's, like I said, it's really important to be clear about do they really need that and if so, why? And can you, can you find a, a better alternative? So the first thing I think that's really important um, in terms of actually how to make this happen is get your clients to learn Drupal as soon as possible. This is actually a picture of Drupal's bookshelf. So um, it's a bit of an extreme example, but there's so much material out, out there that clients can use to educate themselves. There are formal training opportunities all over the world. There are even free training days you can recommend. You can hold a workshop with the whole team and just show them kind of the basics, the most important things, and just give them an idea of the way Drupal works. We recommend that all of our clients take the Drupal in a day Acquia course. Um, and by the end of the day, they'll have built a Drupal site using views, contextual filters. They, they learn a lot of things that they definitely won't be using on a site that we build, but it's, really, it's a really great way of getting them to understand how things work, and then they can be better at communicating how they envision that it will work. Um, suggest books to read, give them Node 1 tutorials, just really make it clear that you expect some engagement from them on this level. Um, get them involved in technical conversations. Don't just say, yeah, tell us what you want. Don't worry about the technical side of it. That's our job. Um, force them to get involved in these decisions. Um, and then when you're, when you're doing a project plan and when you're laying out your project, um, budget for it because you're gonna need this time to talk things over and to really iron out the specifics. So no matter how prepared the client is, they might come in and say, no, I've got a 200 page RFP. I don't need any requirements gathering. This is all you need. Just explain that um, yeah, the RFP is great as a, as kind of an, uh, I don't know, blueprint is the wrong word, but it's great to give us an idea of what you're expecting, but it's definitely not enough to communicate the final outcome. It, you'll just, you'll never get what you need from a document that's been provided by the client. So just include this in the budget. Just say this is part of what we do. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just padding your estimates. It's not just a contingency. It's something that you need. So just tell them we start with, it pretty much, I mean, this isn't specific to every project, but say 20% of the project budget is gonna be spent on starting things off, getting things, um, getting a project vision established, and um, really working together with them to do that. So your inception phase can include any number of things, but it should start with a, a kickoff meeting where you get together with them, you discuss roles and responsibilities, you know, you kind of iron out the details of how you're gonna work together, but you also establish a project vision, which is just a really quick statement outlining the, the purposes and the goals and, and what the client hopes to achieve from this project. And it's really important that you actually kind of um, keep referring back to that and remember that that's what you're doing and, and don't get lost in kind of a sea of feature requests and scope creep because at the end of the day, you need to just achieve that, that vision. It's not about um, kind of change requests and all that sort of stuff and, and well, why doesn't it do this? Just keep referring back to the vision and say, well, yeah, we can do that, but do you really need us to do that? Because that's not really what, that's not really what the project was initially supposed to be. Um, and the other things are just workshops. If, if they don't wanna get you in, in a room with their staff, send out a feedback form and get just kind of some highlights about what they're expecting, consultations. Um, and you, so use that vision that you've established to kind of get an idea of how the work is gonna be shaped. So you know, if it's a project that's really strictly about the front end, they don't, they don't like the way the site looks, they wanna improve the kind of use, end user functionality, that's fine, but if you, if you find out through your consultations that actually the what CMS editors hate it, the, hate the current CMS, then that's, that's gonna really have to shape the rest of the project, and they might not have mentioned that actually. 
So through your inception phase, you should, like I said, establish the roles and responsibilities. And the most important person on a project is the product owner. That's what we call the, the client lead in Agile. But it doesn't really matter who, who, who you call it, whether it's the client project manager, the client lead, whoever it is. Um, this is basically your ideal product owner. He's, he or she is smiling and you know just reveling in all their responsibilities and ownership. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, we're going to collaborate. This is, this is great. Um, Ideally, it should be somebody who uses the CMS on a regular basis and not just somebody that the client assigned to it because they want to make sure it doesn't go over budget. It should really be somebody that can get engaged throughout the build and make decisions and give you useful feedback. And you really should expect a certain level of engagement because, like I said, this is absolutely the most important person on the project. It can make it or break it. Um, and I've seen this happen at a project that sort of was really vague in the beginning, but ended up going really, really well because the client was really engaged and really involved. At the same time, a, a project that seemed like it was planned out to the detail, and then the product owner just really didn't care. And in the end, the client didn't get what they wanted. Um, so we do daily scrums. We send out weekly reports. We have approval deadlines. We have ex expected response times all up front. But, um, but the reality of it is, a lot of times your product owner can end up looking like this. I mean, in some cases, it's just not a job they wanted. They didn't want to get involved in the project. They didn't want the hassle. You know, They're managing internal expectations. They've got committees. They've probably also got 10 other jobs. And, and meanwhile, they're just stressing out about the budget and constant surprises and just being bombarded with um, requests from you. If it's too much to handle, you've really got to take that into consideration and figure out how you can reduce what you're expecting of them. So, you know, just say, hey, what can we do to make this work? Is a once a day email too much? Is a once a week email too much? Um, how, can, how can you kind of um, hand over part of your load to us? So you give us a really big kind of overview of what you'll accept. We'll try to take on that role of, um, of product owner. So in Scrum, that's sort of how it works. The Scrum master can take on the responsibility of product owner if the product owner is not available. And this works out really well because, um, like I said, the, the, oftentimes the product owner is not thrilled with this job. And um, in that case, you really have to help. Oh. Um, and if you do have a good product owner, you can take advantage of one of the things that I think Drupal is best for, which is prototyping and doing iterations and doing demos. So everybody knows this already in this room. You can really quickly add new features. Um, and so in cases where the client isn't sure, you can say, well, let's try this contrib module. Does it meet most of your needs? No, not really. OK, well, let's try another one. I mean, that can take just a few hours to, to get to the right decision. So instead of spending, say, a week or even a day or whatever it is, trying to think of every possible eventuality and writing it down and saying, if this, then this, and then we need this, and then we need this, just say, let's try something. Let's try something and see how it actually works. And then we can probably answer a lot of these questions without getting too far into it. And the other thing is it saves unnecessary dev time. So if the client says, I need these 10 things, you go off and do those 10 things. Well, sometimes they would have been happy with two of the 10. But you really you, you can't know that because you didn't tell them. This is um, a very in-depth requirement for managing links that came straight from an RFP. And at this point in the project, we were um, up to our eyeballs in scope creep. And you know, we looked at a list like this, and we said, some of these make a lot of sense. Some of them are redundant. Um, some of them I don't even think are clear. So you know, something like, it should not be possible to have broken links within the site managed by the CMS. <laughs> I mean, content editors will find a way. <laughs> No matter what you do, they'll find a way to have broken links. This is just not very realistic. So like I said, at this point, there was a lot of scope creep happening. Um, the budget was a concern. So what we said was, let's focus on that top line, which is the overall goal of ensuring that there will be no broken links on the site. So this is really all they wanted. They wanted to be able to manage links so that they didn't have a bunch of 404 pages. Um, we gave them a very pretty 404 page just in case. but. Um, we re you really have to focus on the core intent of the requirement. So that was the goal. We don't want to have a lot of broken links. Clearly, they came from a system where they had a lot of broken links. So this was a major problem. And I think as a result, they kind of overreacted and, and got, got a little too specific. So what we said was, let's start simple. We'll set up a link content type for managing external links. So there was a node ID for every external link on the site. Every time they linked 
off the site, they were linking to a node ID. And that way, if they needed to change it or if it got broken, they only needed to change it in one place. They didn't even have to go around finding everywhere that it was linked to. The next thing is the link checker module, which um, actually satisfies two or three of those requirements just out of the box. It runs periodic reports or it runs um, manually. Every time cron runs, it does a sweep of every single link on the site and um, checks for broken links. You can, you can use that to generate reports, you can use it to generate notifications, um, but it's a really great tool. And the other module we suggested was Linkit, which is um, a way of linking within your Drupal site through the WYSIWYG without manually typing in, uh, without using that link icon. So you're linking directly to a node ID, you're not linking to an alias, which can be really confusing for editors to say, well, I don't understand why there's a number here, um, why can't I just link to the alias? And the reason, of course, is that the alias might change, but the node ID will always be the same. So we implemented this, it ticked most of the boxes, and it was pretty simple. It really didn't take a lot of time. And we said, look, we'll do this for you, you test it out, let us know if you need more, and we can add more to it. But in the end, um, they were really happy with it. it. It totally met the goal without too much complexity. Because I think you also have to be careful when you're trying to tack on layer and layer and layer of protection. It, it can become a burden for the editors because um, if there are too many places they have to go to check things, they're just not gonna do it. So like I said, this was really simple. You have the link checker report, and that's pretty much all you need to um, uh, manage those broken links. And the next thing that I think is really important is, um, it goes without saying that you guys all have expert Drupal teams. I don't need to tell you guys that it's really important to use developers who know how to use Drupal very well. Um, but your whole team should really have a, a good understanding of the way things work. And you know, even your sales team should know a little bit about it so that they're not going off making promises that either you can't keep or that are just too expensive to keep. So um, beyond that though, I really think it's important to get the developers involved in the process as soon as possible. Show them wireframes, um, show them requirements, bring them to client meetings, get them talking to the client. And I think it really gets them involved in the whole um, in the whole project vision, and then I think as a result, they take more ownership of it. So they don't just see it as, um, here's this list of tasks, just complete it and then tell me when you're done, and I'll, and I'll worry about it from there. They, then they can kind of get involved and, and give you ideas and say, oh, you know what? Um, you said you would do it this way, but I think actually a better way and a, and a faster way or an easier way might be to do it this way. And then the other thing is that you can actually vet their approach. You can say, um, no, I, don't tell me you can do it. I know you can do it, but how are you gonna do it? Because a lot of times, developers' minds work in a little bit of a different way. They're not thinking about the, the content management side of things. They're thinking about what's the quickest, what's the easiest, what's the technically best way of doing this, where a lot of times, um, if you actually ask them their thought process, uh, you can say, yeah, that's actually a great idea, that's really clever, but I don't, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, and this, I think, could be a whole talk on its own, but. Um, <laughs> you can't ignore the content editors. Um, their input and feedback is just so critical, and if you don't have them on your side, you're in big trouble. And I think what we found a lot of times is that the client kind of resists this concept of we should consider what the content editors want. They say, nah, there's too many, it's too much of a hassle, we don't want to hear from them. And if you find that that's the case with the client, then you need to be the advocate. The, the, the content editors need an advocate. And if they don't have one in their organization, then you have to be that person. Because even if the, cl the client says we don't want to hear from them, they're going to hear from them at some point. Um, and, and if you wait too long, then it's too late and it's going to be really expensive to fix. And um, I did some custom training recently for a very large web team at the end of a very complex build. And we were, you know, there were a few bugs still, but I was really excited and um, got there and I was all bright eyed and, and ready to show them how things worked. And, I mean, just about every 15 minutes they would say, um, why, why does this work like this? And we'd say, well, that's what they told us to do. And they'd say, but that really doesn't work for me. And you know, oh, okay. And, and you can hear that a few times before you kind of think, well, I can't just keep blaming it on the product owner. I can't just keep blaming it on the web team. Because at some point, it just gets to be ridiculous. Like, wh why, were, why were we making these decisions? And why was the client just completely ignoring what the content editor wanted, and half the time, they, they, they spec these really complicated features as a way of making things easier for the content editors. And in the end, they hated it. It was so automated, they had very little freedom, and I think the, the client thought that they could kind of um, rein in bad behavior by having a lot of limitations in the CMS, 
and it really didn't work. So what came out of that training, and I did about five of them, so by the end I just said like, I know, I know you hate it, but just, I'm just gonna show you how it works. Um, if you have feedback on why you think it should work differently, please follow that up through the appropriate channels, but I can't help you. <laughs> so um, find out about how their current CMS works. Talk to them. Do they hate it? Probably. Why do they hate it? What do they hate most about it? What are the top 10 things they hate? What are the top 10 things they do every day that they wish could be made simpler? Um, on the off chance that they love their CMS, find out why they love their CMS. Are they gonna hate you for screwing it up? Um, it's probably not even that complicated. Like content editors, they have a very difficult job, and, and I, I did this job for four years, so I know how it is, and it, it, there's just nothing more exasperating than being shown a brand new CMS that you had absolutely no input on, and just sort of scratching your head and thinking, why did they do that that way? That just doesn't make any sense. So um, you just need to insist on it. Just say it's built into your process. So if the client says, no, we don't want you talking to the content editors, just say, you know what, I know it's probably really politically delicate and sensitive and you don't want to open a can of worms, but this is what we do. So we're going to come in, we're going to have this workshop. You can be the bad guy, you can settle disputes, but it's just really important to get that feedback as soon as possible. Because like I said, if you wait till the end of the project and you show them what it's like and then they get their, you get their feedback, then you have 100 angry people um, criticizing every little thing. And even if you, even if you hear from them at the beginning, um, it's, it's a nice way of kind of explaining if you prioritize the things that you want us to do most, we'll probably get to those. We're not gonna be able to do everything you want. We're not gonna make you the perfect system. But just giving them that tiny little voice and making them feel like they've been heard can go a really long way. So th this is kind of along the same lines, but you're building a content management system. You're not just building a website. So matching the design is just not gonna cut it because a lot of times the design doesn't specify how the, the back end's gonna work, and that's a really critical thing. So there are always a lot of different ways to do it in Drupal, and you need to pick the one that works best for them. And the only way to do that is to talk to them. So find out who's gonna be performing this task, how often are they gonna be doing it. Um, you know, you say, well, there's a really simple way we can do this, but it might take them a little longer to do it um, in the CMS, so is it worth spending a couple more hours of development to make this a simpler task? And this is a wireframe we got from a client. Um, it seems very straightforward. Bunch of blocks with some dynamic lists and um, it was a layout that only appeared once on the site. So this was not a repeated layout, it was a, just a once-off page. And um, it seemed really obvious to us. Once-off layout, there actually isn't any original content on this page at all. It's all references to other content. So we said, panels, beans, blocks, and views, no problem, we're using that elsewhere. It's very simple and it's very efficient. The problem was when we delivered this to the client, they said, yeah, it looks right on the front, but why isn't it a node? Everything else is a node. Where's the node edit page? I'm so confused. <laughs> How do we manage it? I don't understand why there are all these little tiny different things that I have to edit and it's not just all on one page. Um, How can we fit it into the content hierarchy? They were using a really complex hierarchical structure uh, and we used the node hierarchy module. Well, we didn't know that this page was in the hierarchy because it didn't actually have a place there, but they intended to use it that way. And of course, since it's not a node, you can't put it in the node hierarchy. So that was a major problem. And the other problem was um, that they wanted to be able to track revisions and beans at this point are not revisionable. So that was just another kind of tick, yep, okay. <laughs> we did it wrong probably. And now, um, you know, it just, it just didn't make any sense to them. And the thing is, it, it's not as if we didn't ask the right questions. We didn't even ask them any questions because the idea that this should be anything but panels, beans, blocks, and views was like just never even under our heads. But in the end, we rebuilt it as a node. And I, I actually don't think we set up a content type just specifically for that one. I think, I think we did like a display mode situation. So um, it, wasn't a <laughs> it wasn't a total disaster. But I mean, from a technical perspective, our implementation made perfect sense. We could defend it um, from a technical perspective easy, but it, it just didn't meet their needs. So it really didn't matter that it made technical sense. Um, it, it was kind of a minor thing. It only affected one page um, and we fixed it, but this wasn't the first time we had a misunderstanding and it definitely wasn't the last either. And I, I think it really led to a dynamic where it just got contentious because we would make a decision, implement it, they would tell us they didn't like it, and then we got really defensive 
we would say, no, 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 we did this right because these five reasons. Um, and we shouldn't be defending that after we've done it. We should be presenting them our plan and then defending it before we build it so that it can be a lot easier to, to change things and, and change our minds. Um, so like I said, it was a small misunderstanding and in the end we fixed it, but these kinds of things really build up and just can, can make the client just sort of feel like you don't get it. And the other point is that, um, like I said, this only affected one page, but sometimes when you make a decision like this, it can affect the entire site architecture. So it can't really be fixed without a major cost. So it's just another example of how we were just thinking different things. We were thinking how to build it. They were thinking, well, what's the, the best way to manage it? So we just didn't consider how our approach was going to affect them. So. Um, the next time we came to do something like this, I start started thinking about how we can um, find out what we need to know. So this was uh, another build we did. It wasn't a complicated build. Um, it's a simple enough design, but uh, for, a, for a content editor, a page like this raises a lot of questions. And the developer would say, yeah, this is no problem. I can do this in a second. But that's not really the point. The point is, how are you going to do it? And the, uh, the client wanted the ability to customize that sidebar content. But the client will say, yeah, I want to customize the sidebar content. OK, well, do you want to do it per page? Do you want to do it per section? Do you want it to be a URL-based sidebar content? Do you want it to be taxonomy-based? Um, do you want it to be based on the menu? There are so many different ways you can do it. So these are just a few of the many, many ways that you can do this. Um, a field on each node, that's a lot of work, right? They can, they can target each page, but it's a lot of work, and you're going to get a lot of duplication. One page per section, it's a little bit more complicated to build, but it's a lot less content to manage and also a little bit less flexibility because every page in that section is going to have the same content. Um, a field on each node, but it inherits if it's empty. That's even more complicated to build, but a lot of flexibility. Again, you can, you can apply it to a lot of content or override it if you need to. And then the final way we thought of is block visibility settings, which is really simple to implement. Um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility, but it can be a little bit scary. That manage blocks page, um, yeah, there's a lot of potential to break things on that page. So you really have to kind of trust that, um, that people are going to know what they're doing there. And I mean, I, this is four of probably 25 different ways you can do this. And each one offers a different balance of um, ease of management, ease of development, and just complexity in general. So you have to think about which one's going to work best. I mean, you're not going to go to the client with 17 different ways of doing it and say, hey, which one would you prefer? Um, think about it from their perspective. How many people are on their team? How many people are going to have to do this? Have they used a CMS before? Do they have any technical ability? Or are they you know, that kind of Microsoft Word mindset? Um, have they ever seen Drupal before? Do they understand how it works? Do they currently do this task in their CMS? And how do they do it there? That's a really important one that I think people forget about. Um, there's nothing worse to me than when the client says, but in my old CMS, <laughs> I could do this. <laughs> and you want to say, yeah, but in your old CMS, it took 24 hours to publish anything, but you can't really go there. So <laughs> you just, you have to kind of get to that before. So ask them, um, so when they say something like, I want to be able to customize it, you have to understand that there are so many different subtleties and nuances to the different approaches that you can take to this. Do they need to version it? Like I said before, we implemented Beans, which worked really great, but um, you can't revision Beans. So that's a really major one. And then again, are there ongoing impl um, maintenance impl implications? So say you set it up using context. Well, we save context in code. So if they want to change it down the road, are they going to need us to update a, a code setting? Um, and in the end, we, we thought it over. And then we went back to the product owner. And we said, what do you think about block visibility settings? Um, she was really familiar with Drupal by that point, And she felt really comfortable using blocks. She said, um, yeah, that sounds good. Um, like I said, it is a little scary, that manage blocks page. So what we did was we locked down the permission and said only admin users can update this setting, which um, in a way limits the flexibility a bit because you only have one or two people that can do it. But it was super cheap, it was super easy, and it's really flexible. So now she can target one page, every page, anything in between, um, using any different number of criteria. Um, this is a quote from a client at the end of an inception phase. Um, at this point, we had more documentation than we knew what to do with. Um, 
they said, we've thought of everything. There's no way anything will change. Um, and of course, everything changed. Everything that could change did change. There were committees that changed their minds. Um, they saw they, they saw the implementation, like we did exactly what they asked, and then they saw it and they said, oh, you know, I think we actually don't want it that way. We want to change that. Um, and sometimes we said, we're going to build it using these two contributed modules. Well, it turns out actually those two modules don't work well together at all. So we're going to have to either do this custom or find a different way of doing it. But the point is that it's not, it's not that um, that guy didn't have a clue. He really thought, well, we've sorted out everything and there's no way anything's going to change. So the, that's really the, it, at the moment, I, you know, at the time he said it, I thought, oh gosh, you know, he really doesn't know. But that's not the point. The point is that um, he's never done this before. So we've done it before a lot, and we're supposed to be the experts. So it's really our job to let them know that um, the end of the inception phase is not going to be the final word. There are going to be a lot of things to do after that, a lot of changes. You're still going to need a lot of input from them. Um, and so when the client says something like this, it's really important not to just laugh it off and, and say, he's in for, for a treat. Um, <laughs> you really have to um, <laughs> kind of educate them. and, and Slowly but surely, they'll, they'll catch on and, and they'll understand um, what, what they need to do. Like, it'll get easier, basically. It gets better, as they say. Um, so that, that client, that product owner who, who might start off with a frown, um, finds that as you keep asking him questions and as you keep peppering him with feedback, he'll get better at giving you what you want on the first go. So he'll say, um, I, know how, I know how I want this done, and I know what to tell them so that they don't have to bother me again which is good. So um, yeah, it, it really is our job as, as the Drupal experts to get from them what you need from them. So like I said, um, things change. Clients change their minds. Developers change their minds. Stuff sometimes just doesn't work. <laughs> so um, the really important thing is, like I said, not to shy away from this and, and not to say, sorry, you told us this. This is how it's going to go. Um, it's really fine to, to go through these kinds of um, back and forth feedback loops. <laughs> we don't actually call them change requests. Like I said, we do add up. But, um, but the idea is still that it's an ongoing process. So you're going to hit road bumps, and you're going you're gonna to have problems. But it's just about honest communication. And, and like I said before, at the, toward the middle and at the end of the project is when you really need to start thinking back to that project, project vision. So as you come down the line and you keep getting these, um, the features just start piling up, and they keep making things more and more complicated, it's your job to stop and say, hey, we can do this. We can do anything you want. But do you really need it? Does this align with the project vision? Can we even do it right in Drupal? You know, does the client keep adding on feature and feature and feature, and they're having you rebuild MailChimp in Drupal? Say, no, we're not going to do this. There's a MailChimp module. Sign up for a MailChimp account. It's going to cost you a lot less money, trust me. Um, so, so just think about, is, is this really adding value? Um, they're paying for it, but are they going to get anything back for it? And then where you need to um, redefine them, change, change the requirements, simplify the requirements, deprioritize things, and just plain eliminate things. But at the end of the day, it's all about um, being clear and telling them in Drupal how you're going to do it. So make sure they understand what they're going to get, rather than sort of this surprise, here's your, here's your UI. Um, hope you like it. Just, it's, it's really just about open communication and, and speaking in Drupal terms and, and demanding that back from them. M make sure they're engaged. Like, it's, it's a system that you're building for them. So this concept that they don't need to know, the Drupal side of it, they're going to need to know at some point. right? When you deliver it, it's theirs. So they're going to have to learn it. They may as well learn it at the beginning. It's going to make everybody's life a lot easier. Um, and, and like I said, we do Agile, but I don't think it really matters what methodology you choose. I think. Um, I think this is still really important. Any questions? <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> oh, sure. How we manage budget? Well, it depends on the client, to be honest. Um, <laughs> some clients don't like the burn down aspect, but I think. It's all about, um, like, if they've agreed to it, then they understand that 
they're burning down against the budget, and um, it, it gives them the flexibility of not worrying about scope creep and not forcing them to kill and change requests. So some of them are really nervous at first, and they say, yeah, I know it's agile, but are we going to get what we, are we going to get what we wanted? And you can say, yeah, 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 like, um, you can tell them all you want, you can reassure them all you want, but it really takes just the first few weeks, I think, of um, building in Drupal and showing them after a week they have a functioning CMS. It's really about building up that trust, and um, we, like I said, we send out weekly reports, so every week we send a list of what we've done, how much it costs, how much is left, um, et cetera. Um, but it, it really is just depending on the client. It, it's whatever makes them most comfortable. But really, once once you have the budget, like like I said, it's 20%, that, that pie chart was 20% inception, 10% delivery, and 70% construction. But if you found that the inception phase only took 15% of the budget, that's five more percent you can use for construction. And they really like to hear that. They like to hear, um, oh, cool, more money. <laughs> That's a good question. I'll have to f go back. I'm not actually sure. Let's see. Um, the question was, how did we resolve the requirement about linking to a node and being able to see the link that's on the target node? Geez. Maybe we didn't. Like I said, they were happy with a, a simple version of it. Let's see. Which one is it? Oh, it must be possible to create increments within pages if the anchors were clearly marked for authors. <laughs> I would say I don't think we did. Because if you really look at that closely, I don't know what it means. Like, authors must then be provided with a simple mechanism to browse a list of relevant anchors when creating links to pages. So when you search for a node to link to, you get presented with a list of the anchor links on that node page. Yeah, I have no idea how you do that. <laughs> yes. Uh, the question was, do we use Redmine and how do we find it? I love Redmine. I've used it before. But um, it's really simple. It's really um, kind of just the basics. It's just what you need. And I think it gives you a lot of flexibility and um, a lot of visibility. And I think that's one that goes back to the agile budget thing. When the client can see exactly what you're doing, um, I think they feel a lot better about you working away all week, kind of in a bubble. Um, they can see what you've done, and they can see how much time. I mean, they can even see how much time we've logged on it. And we do have clients that say, uh, that, that seems to take. <laughs> a lot longer than I thought. What's the story with that? Um, and there are forums, and there are backlogs, and there are a lot of plugins for Redmine that you can do to enhance it and extend it. Well, it's, I would say dated, is, I think, is the wrong word. I think it's just really um, minimal. So Basecamp is really pretty, and, it, and it, um, it looks really nice. But I think it's also kind of overkill, and it has a lot of flowery features that can get in the way, whereas Redmine is just basically an HTML page with links on it. So, I mean, you can embed images, and you can embed media, and you can upload documents, but it's very, uh, I would say it's very utilitarian, but in a good way. Yeah, and, and like I said, there are, there are plugins and extensions, and you can, you can theme it, I'm sure. You can make it look prettier, but it seems like a, I don't know, it seems like a waste. Yes, this is uh, my, um, business director, so.
Yeah, but. But it, it, it's never a surprise. So you're, yeah, you're never going to get to the last week and you go, oh my gosh, we're not going to finish. It's so, it's so clear and, and everything's estimated and so it's, it's much more, um, you're much more ahead of it than that. So halfway through, you can get a really good idea of are we going to be able to finish everything that's in there. If we're not, what are the things you can live without? And if you can't live without anything, then what you can do is say, there's 10 things in here, we think we can do six. If we simplify those six, we can do eight. If we simplify them even more, we can do all 10. There are a lot of options, and I think a, a lot of clients that might have been afraid of Agile at first find that really comforting and actually really cool. They don't have to fill out a change request every time they want something. And you're not constantly fighting them and saying, actually, that wasn't in the RFP, so we're not going to do that unless you, <laughs> unless you pay us more. Um, I, th I find that they actually quite prefer that. Yeah, the question was if you if you don't have the ability to do workshops and you do have kind of limited access to requirements. I, I think, obviously, like I said, budget for it and, and explain that, th that it's required and, and really try to educate them about the fact that um, if they do tell you what they want, they'll actually get what they want. And the way you can do that is like say, if you have a client that says, I don't, I don't care about Drupal and I don't want to talk to you about Drupal, just do what I say. If, if you have an example like that panels page where we built them something that they didn't want, you can go to them and use that as evidence. So if, if that's the case, if they won't tell you much and they won't give you much access, the first few times that it gets contentious and the first few times that you find they're not getting what they want, take that as an opportunity to start a conversation about, um, you know, if, if you did learn a little bit about Drupal and if you did give us a little bit more feedback, you'd be a lot happier with the result. But I mean, of course, um, some clients <laughs> just won't hear it, so what can you do but kind of cover your butt and <laughs> stick to the word of the requirement? I, I, it's an unfortunate situation. I mean, I, I know that it does happen, but um, there's not much you can do other than stick to the letter of the, of the contract. <laughs> mm-hmm. Be okay. Yes, that's right. Um, fantastic, Pam. Look, could you please show your appreciation for Pam Barone? <laughs> and it looks like we're going to get an early minute. And during this early minute, you could perhaps fill in your uh, feedback on, in the evalu in the uh, evaluation uh, forms on your program schedule page. Uh, you can do it for this session and uh, also the other sessions that you've been to. That'd be great.